Here we have problem one from the 2024 IMO, International Math Olympiad. Like all the IMO problems, it's a really nice problem. Um, being problem one, it's more accessible than the other problems. It is going to take a bit of time and a bit of concentration, determination to stick with it and follow the problem through. Should also say before we get into it, well done USA for coming first place this year. Second place uh, China, third place Korea, fourth place India, fantastic result. And fifth place Belarus, also a huge improvement from that team. Okay, so the problem is to determine all real numbers alpha, such that for every positive integer n, floor of alpha plus floor of two alpha plus floor of three alpha, etc., all the way up to n alpha, is a multiple of n. And this last sentence explains that floor function for us, so these brackets um, indicating the greatest integer less than or equal to, for example, if we're at negative pi, are we round further down to negative four? Floor of two, we just stay at two. If we're floor of 2.9, we round back down to two. So almost always the best way to get started with something like this is just to sub in some numbers and see what happens. So let's start subbing in some numbers for alpha. We're trying to solve for a real number alpha, um, but let's just say if alpha is a whole number to start with. So if alpha is equal to one, then you know this thing has to be a multiple of n for all integers n. So let's start with n is equal to one. When alpha is one and n is equal to one, we just get the floor of alpha, which is four of one is just one. Um, one is a multiple of one, so we're all good so far. Um, but when we sub in n is equal to two, so we don't really need to worry about the floors because floor of a whole number is just um, a whole number. So floor of one is one, um, floor of two is two. But we get one plus two, which is three. Now three is not a multiple of two. So therefore the test fails. The sum is not a multiple of n for all n. And we can say that alpha equals one is definitely not a solution. So that's good, let's try alpha equals two now. If we sub in um, alpha equals two and n equals one, we'll just get two. When n equals two, we'll get um, alpha plus two alpha, which is two plus four, that is six. Six is a multiple of two. Keep going, um, alpha plus two alpha plus three alpha is two plus four plus six, that's 12, which is a multiple of three. Keep going again, you can see we get that same sum, two plus four plus six, well we had 12 from before, Add a, we get 20, yes, still looking good. Um, add another term, so we're adding an, uh, five alpha, which is 10, we get 30, it is a multiple of five. So it's looking like um, when alpha is equal to two, this seems to work, that we always get this sum being a multiple of n, no matter what the value of n is. And we can actually prove that that's always gonna be the case when alpha is equal to two. In fact, when alpha is equal to any even integer. Um, and we can do so using this formula, so the sum of the integers from one to n is always gonna be equal to n times n plus one over two. Now, if you haven't seen that formula before, I think the easiest way um, to explain it, to understand it is think about adding the numbers, for example, from one to five. Um, what we can do to simplify that is replace all of the numbers with the middle number, which is three. We haven't changed the sum. So we can always do that. The average is always gonna be uh, n plus one over two, the middle number, and then we get n times that average number. So n times n plus one over two. So given that, now our sum, we get alpha times n times n plus one over two, that's our formula. If alpha is even, then alpha over two is going to be an integer. So what do we have? We have an integer multiple of n. So therefore the sum is always a multiple of n for all even integers n. So that's good, we've got a, a set of solutions which is all even integers. Uh, if alpha is odd, however, then this is actually never going to work. So if we look at our sum again, which is the same, alpha times n, n plus one over two. If alpha is odd, then it's not divisible by two. And if we want this to be a multiple of n, then that means then n plus one would have to be divisible by two. Uh, but that's not going to work for all n. Okay, so actually if n plus one is odd, then it's not going to be divisible by two. We know alpha is not divisible by two, so this thing would not be a multiple of n. Okay, so we're going well so far. Uh, we've shown that for integers, it always works for all even integers, it never works for any odd integer. But of course, alpha does not have to be an integer, it can be any real number. So what happens if alpha is not an integer? Again, we're gonna use our strategy of trying some uh, numbers and see what happens. So if we try, for example, um, alpha is a half, 
And then for n equals 1, we just get the floor of a half. Now, the floor of a half, we round down to 0, actually is a multiple of 1. Okay, so we say 0 is a multiple of any number because 0 is like 0 times any number. Uh, if we try n equals 2, so we get floor of alpha plus four, floor of 2 alpha, we get 0 plus 1, which is 1. Now, 1 is not a multiple of 2. So alpha equals a half is not in our solution set. Let's try another one. Say alpha is equal to 2 thirds. Um, when n equals 1, the floor of 2 thirds is 0. That's fine. Uh, but when alpha is equal to 2, we'll get the floor of 2 thirds plus the floor of 4 thirds. 0 plus 1, again, is 1, not a multiple of 2. Um, let's try another one. Like how about something bigger than 1, like 1 and 3 quarters, uh, which we could also write as 1.75 or 7 over 4. When n equals 1, the floor is 1. That's fine. When n equals 2, the floor of 2 times alpha, uh, we can work out that the floor is actually 3. So 1 plus 3 is 4, and that actually works. When n is equal to 3, so we've got um, alpha, 2, alpha, 3, alpha. Well, alpha and 2 alpha, we had that from the previous sum. We know that's 4. Okay, so all we need to do is work out the floor of 3 alpha. Uh, 3 times 7 over 4, we can work out that that is just over 5. Um, so now we add 4 plus 5 to get 9, and actually it still works. So, you know, are we onto something here? Uh, let's try n is equal to 4. From the first three terms, we have 9 from our previous sum. And then we're adding on the floor of 4 alpha. We can work out that that is 7, and we get 16. 16 is a multiple of 4. Okay, but if we try the next one when n is equal to 5, we add on to our 16, the floor of 5 alpha, and we can work out that we get 16 plus 8, which is 24. That is not a multiple of 5, so our fraction... Uh, one and three quarters actually fails and it's not a solution. So after trying these examples uh, where alpha is not an integer, you might be starting to suspect that actually there's not any other solutions um, that are not integers, but you know, besides the even integers we found before. Um, but let's just try one more example. So let's take a negative. We haven't taken a negative yet. So if we try um, alpha is negative one fifth, um, for n equals one, floor is negative one, for n equals two, um, 2 alpha is still has a floor of negative 1, so we're still good. Negative 2 is a multiple of 2. Um, when n is equal to 3, we have our negative 2 from the first two terms, and 3 alpha is still uh, less than, well, it's still within negative 1 and 0, so the floor is still negative 1. Um, the sum is negative 3, still works. And the same thing is going to keep on happening for n equals 4 and n is equal to 5. It's only when we get to n is equal to 6 that that 6 alpha term becomes now um, as larger than 1, the size is larger than 1. So the floor of negative 6 on 5 is actually negative 2. The whole sum becomes negative 7, which is not a multiple of 6. So looking at this example, I think really helps because we can see like actually worked fine for the first five integers. Okay, alpha was um, negative 1 on 5. And for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it worked out fine. The sum was a multiple of n. But as soon as um, n was 6, this last term became too large. So there's actually something going on there which is significant. And I think to really nail down what that is, it helps to focus on alpha between, say, 0 and 1 first. So if alpha is any uh, real number between 0 and 1, the floor is always going to be 0. Now if we look at 2 alpha, okay, because when n equals 2, we need to do alpha plus um, 2 alpha, there's now two possibilities for the floor of 2 alpha. If alpha is less than half, then both alpha and 2 alpha are going to have a floor of 0. But as soon as we get to a half, when we double it, um, we're going to be 1 or bigger. So if we're bigger than a half, the floor is actually going to be 1. Floor of alpha plus floor of 2 alpha is going to be 0 plus 1, and that is no longer going to be a multiple of 2. And we can keep on going like this and break um, the interval between 0 and 1 into thirds. And within that first third, you know, the floors are all going to be 0 because 3 alpha would be less than 1. So we still get 0 plus 0 plus 0. That's great. Still a multiple. Um, but as soon as we get beyond one third, well, these for these values here, um, the floor of three alpha is going to be now one, okay? Because three times one third would be one. Anything bigger is going to be bigger than one. So we'll get zero plus zero plus one. It's no longer a multiple of three. And actually, I don't really need to check any of the rest because I know that any alpha values that are bigger than a half already failed the test for n is equal to two. 
So I've now narrowed down my possible set of solutions to within zero to one third. Um, and you can probably see where this is going now because if I kept on going, each time I'm going to be narrowing down that possible interval of solutions for each time n increases by one, the width of that interval um, of possible solution values is going to be split into two intervals. And for the left of those intervals, the sum is going to continue to be zero. Um, but for the right of the intervals, the sum is going to be zero plus zero plus zero plus one. And therefore it's going to fail. The width of that interval of possible solutions is going to decrease and it's going to approach zero. But if alpha is a solution, it has to be a solution for all values of n. And as n approaches infinity, the interval between zero to one on n is going to approach uh, zero. There's going to be no alpha value small enough that it's always less than one on n, except zero itself, which is an even integer. We already know that's a solution. Um, and now we can do a similar thing for the interval between negative one and zero. For any alpha between negative one and zero, the floor is always negative one. Um, if we look at two alpha, we now split into two intervals. Um, and for the right of those intervals, the floor is going to be negative one plus negative one. That's negative two, that's fine. Um, but as soon as we go beyond negative one half, two alpha then has a floor of negative two. So negative one minus two uh, is negative three, which fails the test because it's not a multiple of two. You keep on going like this. Um, and in this time, the right of the intervals, the one that's closer to zero, uh, all, it's all negative ones. Okay, so negative one times n is a multiple of n. But the left of those intervals is going to be like a sum of negative ones and then one negative two on the end. Well, that gives you negative uh, n minus one or negative bracket n plus one, which cannot be a multiple of n for all n. So now we've actually ruled out any values of alpha between negative one and positive one except for zero. And it's looking pretty unlikely that there's any other uh, solutions alpha besides the even integers we found. Um, but we do need to prove it for any of those values that are bigger than one or less than negative. For me, it helped to continue that number line approach for a few more numbers. And what we can notice if we do that, the width of possible solutions then is getting narrower around zero and the next one is around two. And we already know zero is a solution, two is a solution, four is a solution, all even integers. So what appears to happen is that the width of the interval around those even integers becomes smaller and smaller, um, approaches zero, and we're just left with the even integers themselves. All right, so now it's time to complete the proof. We will need a little bit of algebra for this, um, but hopefully like the intuition and what we've done above is gonna be really helpful. Um, just to recap, what have we actually shown? We've shown that all even integers alpha are solutions, um, no odd integers alpha are solutions, and no values of alpha between negative one and one uh, besides zero are solutions. What we're gonna do is basically use what we've done above um, for the integer case and like the, the fraction case where the fractions were less than one, because actually for any real value alpha, we can always write it as the sum of an integer and a fraction less than one. Uh, so using some algebra, we can write any alpha as k plus beta, where k is an integer and beta is between zero and one. Um, and the good thing is when we multiply by n for n alpha and take the floor of that, again, nk is an integer. So the floor becomes nk plus the floor of n beta. And we're getting really close now um, because if we let the fraction part be negative, so let's say um, if beta is between negative one and one, well, we actually can even do better and write our alpha as the sum of an even integer and beta, okay? Because any real number is either an even number plus a little bit or an even number minus a little bit. So let's say alpha is equal to um, e plus beta, where e is an even integer and beta is between negative one and one. Um, that's great because, you know, it's still true that the floor n alpha is uh, n e plus the floor of n beta. So if we want the sum of alpha, a floor of alpha plus floor of two alpha plus floor of three alpha, etc., we can separate that into the sum of the even integer parts and the sum of the fraction floors. And we already know from above, we already proved that the sum of the even integer parts um, is always a multiple of n. But the, fl the sum of those floors of fractions, which are between negative one and one, is not a multiple of n, okay? Unless beta is zero. So therefore the entire sum cannot be a multiple of n for all n and that completes the proof. 
let's just demonstrate that with an example with a number. So for example, if alpha is uh, 5.9, then we write um, alpha as the next even number, which is six minus a little fraction, uh, 0 0.1. Floor of uh, six minus 0 0.1 plus two times that, so 12 minus 0 0.2 plus three times that, which is 18 minus 0 0.3, um, etc. And we can split that up into the sum of the integer part, 6 plus 12 plus 18, uh, etc., all the way up to 6n, um, minus those the floors of those fraction parts. So 0 0.1 plus floor of 0 0.2 plus floor of 0 0.3, etc. And we know that for the integer part, we know that is a multiple of n. We proved that above using the sum of our consecutive integers formula. And for the fraction part, because 0 0.1 is between 0 and 1, and we already proved above that no values of alpha between 0 and 1 uh, actually give you a sum that's a multiple of n. All right, so that's it. I hope that made sense to you. Thanks for watching to the end and sticking with it. Um, if you have any questions about any part of that, or if I said something wrong, you want to correct me, please feel free to leave a comment and a thumbs up. I'll appreciate that as well. <laughs> okay.